Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the presentation of our paper titled Security Reductions for White Box Key Storage in Mobile Payments. My name is Estuardo, and this is a joint work with Chris Bruska, Mark Fischlin, Christian Jansson, and Will Michels. And in this work, we're going to be focusing on the white box attack scenario. And in this attack scenario, we consider software cryptographic implementations with embedded secret keys on them. And we consider an adversary who gets access to the implementation code of these cryptographic algorithms. And the adversary is able to inspect the code. He's also able to, to modify it. He's able to control also the execution environment of the code. And he can collect input output pairs, for instance, and perform dynamic and static analysis. And so in white box cryptography, um, we aim to um, implement cryptographic algorithms in such way that they remain secure even in the presence of such strong adversaries. Okay, so white box crypto for mobile payment applications. So um, 20 years ago, white box cryptography was introduced in the context of digital right management applications. And in DRM, what we have is we have some service provider which broadcasts some, some content or some information in encrypted form. And then we have a set of uh, subscribers who, who um, are allowed to recover this content. Uh, so more concretely, the subscribers uh, get a decryption program which lets them then decrypt and thus recover this content. And here, uh, white box crypto is being used um, as, a, as a means to mitigate uh, attempts of piracy on these decryption programs. So like to ensure that only uh, users who actually subscribe are, are the only ones who can recover this content. Uh, but then in a different context, in 2015, Android introduced host card emulation, um, which would allow the application processor of a mobile phone to use near field communication. And then here, vendors of mobile payment applications saw an opportunity of um, implementing such applications completely in software. And so, so as we're going to describe in a bit um, in more detail, these mobile payment applications, they use the NFC, um, the NFC chip for communicating with a payment terminal. Um, and thus, uh, implementing these applications in software only had the benefit that uh, it would increase their deployability, so, so it would be easier to distribute them, uh, but also that the vendors could implement them without having to think too much about the phone that was, that was going to be using them. So yeah, so any phone running um, on Android uh, would be able to, to use such applications or to run such applications. And uh, white box crypto was then proposed uh, from the beginning as a software countermeasure technique to protect these mobile payment applications. So, and to look at it in a bit more detail, this, um, the payment applications, they basically serve the same purpose as a traditional credit card. So, so if I'm in a shop or anything and I want to make a payment, then with this application, I uh, I open it and then um, I come to the point of service to pay. Uh, yeah, and, and then I, I generate a request message. So, so in more detail, what happens is that um, the application stores some limited use keys in encrypted form. And these limited use keys are specific for the owner of the application. And then every time I want to, I want to make a payment, I decrypt one of these keys and then I use one of these keys for generating a request message. And so this, this key also uh, uh, authenticates me as, as, the, as the owner of the application. Um, and so what we usually white box here is the decryption program and then, uh, yeah, and then also the encryption program using the limited use key. And why is white box being used here? So yeah, we consider the case that uh, the mobile phone might be infected with a malware which is then listening and observing the processes uh, within the, the operating system. And so the idea here is for the adversary, his goal is to um, try to recover an LUK and then use it by himself, use it independently to perform a payment. Um, and then to do this, the adversary uh, 
for instance, he could try to, to derive the value of a secret key from just observing the ciphertext. Um, or alternatively, he could try to extract the decryption key um, and then use this decryption key for recovering the LUK. So uh, this, is, this is where the idea came from. So the, the idea is that then uh, using a white box decryption program should make it difficult for the adversary to, to then extract the key and thus recover the LUK. Um, however, there's another attack vector for this adversary that we also need to consider. And it's the case that uh, the adversary might also just try to copy the complete payment application uh, with the encrypted limited use keys and then run the copy of this application on any, any device of his choice and use it for paying anywhere in any terminal of his choice, right? And in this case, the adversary doesn't really need to um, extract any, any specific information from the application um, or perform reverse engineering attacks since he can just run a copy of the software program. Um, and thus, uh, considering this, uh, such white box programs and payment applications in this case need to uh, provide some protection against such attacks, which we refer to as code lifting attacks. So in this work, we focus on the property of device binding as a means for mitigating code lifting attacks on white box programs. And the idea of device binding is that um, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, generate a white box program in such a way that it can only be executed on one specific device. And if the program is being executed on a different device, then the program should be useless. So the idea is that for instance, for an encryption program, if, um, if I want to perform an encryption, uh, I'm going to check if I'm running on the on the intended device. So in this case, uh, the device is identified by, by a specific hardware identifier Delta. And, and so if I am there, then I will perform an encryption and then output the ciphertext. And if I'm not, then I should just output um, an error message. And so in this presentation, uh, it will become quite clear why we, we choose to focus on device binding given that it seems to be the best suited uh, method for protecting against code lifting attacks for applications running on mobile phones. Uh, but um, I'm not gonna be talking so much about uh, why we choose device binding over other methods uh, which have been proposed in the literature, in the white box related literature. Uh, but we have this other work called on the security goals of white box crypto, uh, where we talk a little, where, where we make a, um, more of a comparison of these uh, methods which have been proposed as a, as a means to mitigate code lifting attacks. But what we do in, in this work is uh, we present security notions for a white box KDF with hardware binding and then also uh, security no a security notion for uh, mobile payment applications which should be secure in the white box attack model. And then uh, we present a corresponding construction for the white box KDF, uh, which is based on puncturable PRFs and indistinguishability obfuscation, and then also a construction for our mobile payment application, uh, uh, which uses the white box KDF as an integral building block. And so in the, in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be talking mostly about the white box KDF, its definition and construction. In the end, I will also mention uh, how we use it within the mobile payment application. And yeah, an, another uh, one way that I also like to look at our construction is that it can also help understand how white box cryptography uh, with uh, device binding can be implemented in real life. So in real life, you, you might want to substitute the puncturable PRFs uh, by more efficient uh, or more popular PRFs uh, or PRF candidates like AES, for instance. And also, instead of using I/O, you might want to use uh, other other methods of obfuscation. Um, but else, the the design um, roadmap is uh, can, can be pretty much applied for um, for implementations in real life. Um, so uh, now we're gonna talk a bit more in detail of um, on how how we see this property of hardware binding. So so what we assume is that the device where we're gonna be running the white box program has some secure hardware, some, some um, hardware component, which is not accessible to the white box adversary. So the white box adversary only sees this as a, as a black box and can see the outputs coming from it and can also query it, uh, but he doesn't see what's inside. 
and this hardware um, hardware component has some secret key material in it, uh, which is obviously unknown to the adversary. Um, and then we're going to be using this secret key material for identifying the hardware. So, so whenever we want to perform uh, some some operation with our white box program, we're going to query the hardware, and then based on this key material, we're going to obtain a response. And then the white box program should should be able to identify if this response corresponds to the intended hardware or not. Um, and so we're going to get into more details uh, just in a, in a minute, but uh, I just have this slide uh, now uh, because this is at this point, one of the questions that comes up the most is um, if, if my device has some hardware, uh, which has some secret key material and apparently supports the execution of cryptographic implement uh, cryptographic operations, then why would I want to uh, use white box crypto anyway, right? And as I mentioned before, one of the biggest advantages is that uh, for the designers or for the providers of the applications, um, they can gain independence from the phone manufacturers. And, and indeed, this has many, many benefits, uh, um, mostly because not all phones will have uh, hardware components, uh, which will provide the same, always the same functionalities. Um, and then there, there also might be the case that you, you might need a white box program which uh, executes some operation which is not supported at all by any, any of these secure hardware components. So um, for the providers, it's, it's then interesting to be able to design a, an application which uh, you can share and then you can, be, you can be sure that any user which has, for instance, which has an Android phone, is gonna be able to use it securely. Um, yeah, and so additionally, uh, usually uh, we have applications which perform a bit more than just one cryptographic operation. So if you see, if you think about our payment application that we described in the beginning, we were first decrypting something and then we were using uh, the decrypted value as, as a key for encrypting something, something else. Um, and so usually when we access these secure hardware components, for performing cryptographic operations, we cannot perform all of them uh, in one go, but we we um, but we need to access it for each operation we want to perform, and and this means also that the, we need to perform a context switch every time we access it. This might lead to some delays, um, and it also means that some of the intermediate values that are being used in the calculations might be exposed. Um, so we might want to avoid this in in, in some cases. Um, and so the idea that we have in this paper is that we want to use this hardware as little as possible, but in an in an effective way, in a secure way. And so we're going to um, we're going to make our hardware binding. We're going to build it based on a simple cryptographic operation, uh, which we can assume that is supported by all hardware components. And we're going to use it only once, um, but then the rest of the calculations are going to be performed. By the white box programs. Okay, so now we're going to look at how we can define hardware binding. And so the idea here is that we're going to define the security for a white box primitive in combination of a hardware module. So next we're going to introduce the syntax of both. And so as mentioned before, we want to construct a white box KDF. So we're going to start off from, from a traditional KDF, which takes as input some secret key K and some context value E. And then based on this context value, it's going to derive um, a, a sub key here, sub key uh, KE. So as you can see, this is a simplified uh, version of a KDF because it just takes these two inputs um, and, and then it derives a key. But the property that we expect from this KDF is that its output, so its key should be indistinguishable from random. So it's, it's output keys. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a white box KDF, which should be functional equivalent to this traditional KDF. Um, but the white box KDF does not take as input the, the key because it already has the key embedded on it. And it will take as input the context value and then some additional value, which is going to be the response uh, from, the, from the hardware. So next we define the syntax of the hardware module and of the white box KDF. So now we're back at this picture. 
where we have our um, our hardware and our uh, secret main key of the hardware, which was generated at random. So now whenever we want to compile some white box program that should um, that should run on this specific hardware, we're going to query the secure hardware with a label value, which will identify this program. And so now based on that label value and based on the on this main hardware key, we're going to derive a sub key. Then um, this sub key is going to be communicated with the entity that is going to be responsible for compiling the white box program. So now here we assume that we're able to um, to share this key with the with that entity securely, of course. And then this entity is going to compile the white box program based on the uh, KDF key K, and then based on this main key KHS. Um, <clears throat> and so, as, as mentioned before, the white box KDF, uh, the compiled white box KDF, will be functional equivalent to the uh, KDF. Uh, yeah, but then assuming, of course, that we are running on the intended hardware. If it's not, then then uh, it will not be functional equivalent, or better said, it, it's going to be useless. So now, when we have uh, the white box already running on the on the device or on the phone, and um, whenever we want to whenever we want to run something or we, we if we want to derive a key, what we do is we query the hardware with uh, the context value that we mean to use and the label which identifies the, the software that we're using uh, or the white box that we're using. And so now, now the hardware is going to generate a response. And this response is going to be generated based on the hardware main key, on the label, and on the context value E. And then this, this response is going to be returned here. Um, and then the white box KDF is going to output some uh, the, the derived subkey. The intended derived subkey, um, and so for a bit of context, you see here uh, the so here we describe the operation flow that follows on the white box KDF. So, so it's first going to perform this check operation, which is going to check for the validity of the sigma, and it's going to do this based on the subkey that we used for compiling it. And then if this check goes through, the, uh, we will um, generate a subkey with the KDF. And if not, then uh, the white box will return an, an output. So uh, now we define the security of the white box KDF. And what we do here is we give the adversary the white box KDF. So here he, he's standing on top of that. But uh, yeah, this just means that he has access to it. Uh, he can inspect it and so on. Mm. And we're going to give the adversary access to a hardware oracle. And uh, this hardware oracle is going to provide him with responses that he can then use for running the white box KDF and then um, analyzing it. So yeah, so as you can see here, uh, it generates a response. Uh, it has some asserts in the beginning that are going to become clear in a second. Um, yeah, and then in the main part of the game, the adversary goes on to play an indistinguishability game with a KDF oracle. And so he queries this oracle, and then a value, a context value is generated at random. And then if the secret B is set to one, we generate a KDF, a, a KDF subkey based on this context. And if not, we just draw some subkey at random. Uh, yeah, and then we return the context and the, the right subkey to the adversary. And yeah, so, so we say that a white box KDF is secure if the adversary is uh, unable to distinguish over here. So now um, a little bit on the construction. So, so here on, on gray, on this uh, gray rectangle, I, I specify how we construct the operations that correspond to the hardware module or that are running on the hardware. So first, the sub K, sub K gen, this operation that we perform in the beginning for generating the sub key that uh, we later use for compiling the white box. Um, so what we do here is we just run a PRF um, uh, on the main key, on the hardware main key, and then on the label. And, based, and this way, we derive the sub key. Um, and then the response that is going to be used for generating the sigma values uh, is going to run a PRF uh, also on the main key and on the label. And then it's going to run a 
puncturable PRF on the resulting value and the context value that we want. Um, so yeah, so um, once we have the two keys, we can give them to the compiler. And the compiler uh, is going to obfuscate the circuit that we see here, which has the, the um, hardware subkey and the KDF key embedded on it. And so as you can see in the beginning, um, it's, going to, um, it's going to input the sigma to a PRG, and then it's going to compare that to the output of a, <clears throat> of a PRG on the, uh, a PPRF on K, uh, on, the sub, on the hardware subkey and E. And so, so basically what it's trying to do is it's trying to recalculate the sigma and then seeing if, if it works properly. Um, yeah, and if that goes through, then we run a PPRF for generating the subkey. Uh, and if not, then, then the circuit just outputs error. And then our compiler is going to apply indistinguishability obfuscation uh, to, to this circuit, and it's going to return our secure KDF. And so now to prove the security of our construction, uh, we apply the puncture programs approach from Sahai and Waters. And our proof is a hybrid argument over the number of queries that the adversary makes to the KDF oracle that we saw in the beginning. And the hybrids are constructed such that in the first hybrid, um, the, um, the game outputs uh, only PRF values all the time. Then in the second hybrid, uh, the first output of the game is, uh, is, is a randomly looking value, but then all following uh, outputs are PRF values. And then in the, in the third one, uh, the first two outputs are randomly looking values, but then the rest are PPRF values and so on and so on. Um, yeah, until uh, we, have, we have a game where all the outputs are randomly looking values. Mm. And then to show that um, each hybrid is, is equivalent to each other, we go over a series of game hops and here we're substitute, we will be substituting the circuit that we want to obfuscate by functional equivalent circuits. And so uh, we're going to have a look now quickly at uh, these functional equivalent circuits that, that, we, that we see. So the first, um, the first or the second circuit that we consider um, is a circuit that is now using punctured uh, keys. Well, the, the first key is punctured the hardware subkey is punctured on the point C. And, <clears throat> and so uh, now we know that if we run the P PRF on the second line um, on a value E that is equal to C, then we're gonna output some, some uh, error in this case. We, we would have output some error in this case. So we add the line in the beginning where we check if the value E corresponds to the, the value C where we have uh, punctured that. And then uh, we check with the PRG, if uh, the PRG on sigma equals the PRG on tau, whereby tau corresponds to the output of the PPRF um, when, when the input is C, uh, the PPRF on the hardware subkey. So, so here we, we show that uh, the first line on the circuit on the left is functional equivalent to the, to the first two lines on the circuit on the right. <coughs> then uh, for the third circuit, we um, hard code a value Y, which corresponds to um, the PRG on tau. So now instead of executing PRG on tau uh, for, for checking if PRG sigma equals PRG on, on tau, we're just gonna check directly if PRG sigma equals Y. And, and there we see uh, also from, from the correctness of the PRG that uh, these two circuits are functional equivalent. <clears throat> then when we go from the third one um, to the fourth one, we substitute uh, the value Y by a value uh, drawn at random <clears throat> from the set uh, of um, values with size 2N. And we hard code also uh, a key, um, key uh, KE star. And this key corresponds to the key that is derived when the PPRF on the key K, so when the KDF basically is queried with a context value equal to C, because now uh, we have also punctured the KDF key. 
and and thus uh, this value we hard coded in it for the case that we um, we are giving us input a value e equal to the punctured point. And so here we also show that these two are functional equivalent. And then on the last circuit, we substitute the um, the second line. So instead of outputting the the key uh, k e star, we output always zeros for this case. And uh, here we we can show that these two are functional equivalent because with high probability, the value y that we chose randomly from the set to n is going to be outside of the image of the PRG um, on, on sigma. And thus we show that these two uh, circuits are functional equivalent. And it's important to notice that for the circuit C5, um, the value, this, this output value, k e star, is not, is not going to be um, relevant anymore. And for this reason, in the eyes of the adversary, it doesn't matter if when he's playing the indistinguishability game, the KDF oracle is outputting uh, values that are actually random or values that are um, or values that are calculated with the PPRF. <clears throat> so um, now we reach the final part of the presentation, and uh, here I will just discuss shortly uh, the. Um, uh, so what, what do we do with this white box KDF? Here we have a, a picture displaying that. So, so we are back now to our um, payment application. Uh, here we call it WPay. That's the notation that we use in the paper. And so here, what we do is that every time we want to uh, perform a payment and we need to decrypt an LUK, what we're going to do is we're going to derive a key based on an ID corresponding to that LUK that we want to decrypt. So we're going to derive a key, and then we're going to use that key for decrypting the LUK. And now we can proceed as, as usual uh, by using the LUK for generating this request message. And the white box KDF is, uh, is only functional in the presence of a specific hardware device. And thus, uh, without this white box KDF, this whole construction, uh, this whole application cannot be used. Um, and thus, the application is hardware bound and also a white box secure. So with this, I finish the presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. And if you would like to see more details on the construction of our payment application, uh, I invite you to have a look at our paper. Thank you.